Hello and welcome to another Fantasy Premier League video. My name is Steve and today we're going through the Game Week 1 Roundup. So, points are all locked in. It was a hell of a game week. <coughs> um, we'll just read out the points quickly for those of you that are just on audio. I went with Warden Net instead of Raya, who scored one point instead of Raya's two. I went with Trent at the back, got one. Cancelo with seven points. Zinchenko, <coughs> uh, my five million defender, got an assist from the corner and scored 12 uh, and James came in with a clean sheet and a bonus point with seven. Across the midfield, we had Martinelli with his goal and eight points. Salah with the goal, <coughs> excuse me, a goal and assist. It captained to 24. We had Neto on two. De Bruyne with the solo assist on five points. Luis Diaz with two points. Could have been a lot more. And Jesus up front with the solo two as well. And the remaining members on the bench, my one playing... Defensive option in Castagna actually scored, <laughs> scored a scored a header from a corner, uh, got eight points. Um, then we had Archer for a solo point, uh, which we expected, and Plange on the bench with zero, totaling 72 points and a game week rank of 1.07 million. Now, obviously, in the very first game week of the season, points are very close together. Um, Assuming you did create a team and all your players started, you basically start with 22 points, 2 times 11 if everyone does nothing. Um, and so there's only a variance here of about 50 points from 22 for me, so each point is worth a lot. Uh, the most, most important point is the average was 57 and we are a good, what, 15 points ahead of that. So that's, that's happy days. Um, I did check out the difference in score between... So 72 points is a game we crank of 1.07 million. 73 points, just one more point, is 897,000. So for every single point at the moment, <laughs> your position is fluctuating about 173,000 places, give or take. So don't worry too much about your game we crank for the first few game weeks. It's more about staying above average. Um, cause each point's just worth a lot. Now, if we go, we're going to go through, hopefully, very quickly. I'm going to try and keep this video short, but each of the games and what I saw quickly, just to um, record it now that all the games are done, what's well, fresh in my mind, so we could come back to it a little bit later in the week. Arsenal <coughs> versus Crystal Palace. Arsenal looked devastating in the first half of the first half. Um, when I sat down, having locked Jesus in my team, um, upgrade from Martial, who got injured, uh, in the le days leading up to uh, Game Week launch, I was actually very comfortable owning Jesus. He was running around, making mean runs. Jeezy was even weaving around players on the edge of the box and get it close to being taken out for a pen. He was looking phenomenal. I was very comfortable with that pick. However, as things do, Game Week 1, adrenaline is high, Crystal Palace, we're never going to be an easy pushover. As soon as they got used to the pace of the game, um, they fought back and held possession very well for the second half of that first half. Now, this actually all started when Ramsdale made that horrific mistake in about the 27-minute mark, where he blasted the ball into the striker and then it deflected off to the left back, I think. And they played the ball around a bit and it eventually went back to Ramsdale again. Then he took on the striker and just went round him and laid the ball off again. It was all very um, on the edge football. And from that point, I think Crystal Palace probably just got it in their minds that they're like, see, these guys can make mistakes. What are we doing? We should actually press on here. And then they played out that second half pretty well. Um, Zinchenko. Uh, specifically, in attack, he looked good. He was going forward. Um, I actually did grab a couple of stills, which I'll pull up very quickly um, from this game, because I was keeping a very close eye on Zinchenko. I wanted to have a look at... Um, so if I bring this one up... So this is... I can't remember. The, I should have grabbed the minute mark. But this is Zinchenko's shot that he took. Um... Inside the box, it's just been laid off from uh, somewhere in the centre of the park. I forget who laid on the ball. But what was really interesting here is when Zinchenko actually 
when he came up to hit the shot, his whole demeanor changed. He slowed down. He focused in on the ball. He didn't lash at it or anything. He actually struck through the ball perfectly. Now, if you actually have a look on screen, you'll see the little... I've drawn a little white arrow here. This is roughly where the ball was from where he struck it. This is through the shot, obviously, and his foot's come through. And you can see the trajectory of the ball. It's a low and far post, which is exactly where you should be striking this ball. He's been on the training pitch hitting these balls. Uh, very unlucky that the defender here who's in his way was actually coming from right to left. As you can see, he's trying to brace for impact. It actually captures his back leg, which he knew nothing about. Otherwise, it would have been very interesting to see where this ended up. It was low, it was hard. The keeper may or may not have saved it. It was definitely on target. And if, even if he did get a hand to it, you've got all of this. <laughs> all these guys just waiting to rush in and, and tap it in. So it was a little bit unlucky on the Zinchenko side. His goal looked like something that came out of the training ground. Because if you have a look on the very far left here, I think you've got Gabriel Jesus standing well out on the by byline. I think just to create the space for Sinchenko here to start his run away from Zaha, who is just not at all aware of who he should be marking. And Zinchenko makes his way right the way into just in front of where the, the, the referee is and heads the ball back across the box to Martinelli, which is awesome. He heads the ball in. Martinelli missed an open goal in this game as well, which is a little bit unfortunate. Could have, it, could have had a couple more points here. But the point I really wanted to bring up was Zinchenko's defending. Now, this has got me worried. This is a, why he got pulled in the match as well. Um, so this this image on screen with was a ball that got sent from about midfield. But the ball came, up high, came out of the air high. Zinchenko and I think this is Jordan Ayew out on the right. I have can't remember but this book they were running side by side when this ball came out of the air right comes down not on a dime but it comes down on, a, on an angle that's easily dealable with but look at how much space Zinchenko has given the striker to control this ball so they're both running towards goal right and the and the striker gets his body between you know defender and ball Zinchenko should be up against him on his touch getting in his back, making it awkward for him. But what has he done? He's taken fucking like five steps. Look at that space. All he has to do is he's taken one touch to, you know, bring it back away from where the defender is. And he's in acres. All he has to do is turn and whip this ball in. Now, this happened maybe about eight minutes or so before Zinchenko got pulled, I think. There was another counter-attack that started in the defense, pushed the ball out to the right-hand side, Zinchenko was just not in the right spot. He was not standing where he should have been. And he just got blitzed for place down the right-hand side because his positional awareness was not there. The transition from attack to defense was just not there either. And they just blasted right down the right-hand side and sent, sent a dangerous ball into the box. And then Zinchenko got pulled. So... Yes, he's done very well in attack, and he did do some all right defending at the start of the match. But as the game went on, I think Crystal Palace figured out that, well, the the Crystal Palace strikers figured out that they wanted the ball on the right hand side because they were just getting so much space being allowed to them by by Zinchenko, and that's where a lot of their attack came down. So I am worried. I would hope that maybe this sees Zinchenko move into midfield a bit quicker potentially um, because he is a little bit of a liability um, out on that left hand side whoever is left centre back is going to have to be doing one hell of a covering job for Zinchenko if they do continue to play him there um, Saliba who I think is sitting on the right centre back uh, I might have that wrong god he looked phenomenal what a buy French international with geez he's calm he's collected he's he, he, he's so aware of what's going on in the game there was this there was this point where he's going he's rushing for the ball the ball's coming out of the air um and he just nudges the slightest of nudges the striker in the back who's running but he he nudges him just as the foot hits the ground and he's just he's just He's taken a step, and that's when he gives him the push just before the ball. It's such a small push that it's not going to 
you know garner the um the attention of the referee but it's enough at the right time that it completely puts the defender off and Saliba wins the ball I mean these types of tricks is just that these are going to save goals for Arsenal he's he's looking absolutely solid and so maybe if he is on the left hand side I will have to double check that maybe he sweeps up for Zinchenko instead Celibus tackle as well in the box. Woo wee! Perfectly timed. Game week one, he's into it. He's just he's well aware of his abilities by the looks of things. So that's looking very good for the defence at Arsenal. Crystal Palace. Um, they just look like they set up to wait out the storm at the start of the game, and then basically just reconstructed counter attacks. Um, they did get hold of the ball quite a bit uh, they didn't look too lethal in attack they don't really have a hell of a lot to aim at up front um, and I think this is why this is the only reason why Arsenal didn't concede to be honest was just the lack of Crystal Palace attack uh, if we go a little bit further down we get a Liverpool game versus Fulham uh, Van Dyke looked slow yeah he did not look on the ball he Van Dyke's always a, looks a little bit casual on the park because he is just he just he he knows where he should be. His distance between players, his movement, his timing is just perfect most of the time. But he did not look on the ball um, in this Liverpool match. It lo- almost looked like he was too relaxed <laughs> at times for some reason. Just thought I'd bring that out because it is something to keep an eye on. I don't know if he's just betting into the season or what it is, but. He did actually cause. He, he didn't slow down attacks when he should have, and he was. I don't know. He just. Maybe it was just gave me quite nerves. It's just definitely something to keep an eye on, right? Um, Diaz scored a goal that was offside. The way he finished that goal is exactly what you want to see. Left hand side where he should be, cuts the ball in right, hooks it. Right, right foot and swing, top, top bins round the keeper. Always looked like it was going in. No one was ever going to stop it. It's just unfortunate that it was offside. So he's striking the ball well. That's good business. And he's hit the post twice in the match. He could have come out of this game with a hat trick, but walks out with two points. And I suspect everyone out there is probably thinking, how do I get to Nunes? Given he's come off the bench and got a goal and a, and an assist. Um, I would just hold hold on to Diaz. This could have been a completely different game if you know there's very small margins of margins of uh, points being a points haul miss here. So I definitely definitely give it another go- game week. However, if you are going to Nunes, wow, what a player! He looks incredibly difficult to mark. He is darting all over the place. He's got a great touch on him. The whole game changed when he came onto the pitch. To be honest. Firmino offers more of your hold-up play, stays in the centre, feeding in the players around him, but not too. doesn't seem like he causes as much chaos in the defence as Nunes does. Nunes, whew, he looks phenomenal. Um, ooh, I'm expecting big things from him coming forward. He probably earned his self, himself a spot to start in game week two, I would say. Um... But we will have to wait and see on that. So for those of you that are considering jumping, excuse me, straight across to Nunes, he may come in off the bench again, and he may do the business off the bench again against tired legs. Maybe he comes off the bench at halftime, or you know, a little bit earlier in the match in the next game. Who knows? But if you are planning to get him in, and it's for a hit, probably. I'm guessing, unless you're somehow going maybe Kane down to Hull, uh, to Nunes, uh, I would just probably h- hold fire on that. I mean, they do have a very nice uh, fixture this this game week uh, against Crystal Palace, but uh, Crystal Palace, as you can see, can be a bit of a bit of a niggly team to deal with. So maybe, hey, maybe do go for it. <laughs> maybe grab the points. Well, no one has them. Who knows, right? Uh, Fulham, I didn't really pick up too much from in the game. Not, not, not a hell of a lot to cover there, so we'll just skip along. Bournemouth versus Villa. Okay, so we Bournemouth is uh, a team that I'm trying to attack. 
the early outsets of the season, obviously their defence is absolutely ruined. Their manager came out and said as much. Um, they have not um, bought very... I don't know if they've bought anyone in pre-season. I haven't really been keeping an eye on them too much, apart from just uh, targeting them. But Aston Villa, holy hell, do you know how to defend? Wow, we there was some horrific states of defence in this match. Ah, uh, the I think that man marking at corners, and that is just that will work not too often. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so this is the second goal that they this this is the wrong one I wanted to show. I wanted to show. Oh, I didn't grab that screenshot. Damn it. Okay, well we'll go. This is the only goal I got. This is the second goal. So this uh, was actually a f free kick. So Aston Villa conceded from two set pieces, essentially. One was from a corner, and one this one actually started, if you could see my mouse on the screen. So if we go out left and high, the, there was a free kick that went far post to this lad. Um, I think it actually got cleared by defender and went out here. And this is the second ball play, right? How... I can't remember the name of the guy that scored this goal from the Bournemouth team. Apologies to Bournemouth fans. I don't really know your players a hell of a lot. But we've got four Aston Villa players in the centre of the box. No one even close <laughs> to one of the two strikers still standing in the box. Don't know what this guy's doing. He's uh, not marking anyone, but making it a little bit easier to make a near post starting run, which he doesn't even need in this case. But... All four of them are ball watching. One guy's marking one man, and the other three, I don't even know what they're doing. They're just it's completely ball watching. The ball comes across in the air. It's not even drilled in. And none of the four defenders from Aston Villa even attempt to jump to to contest with the only guy that the ball's heading towards. It's, what are they doing? And the, the corner that they conceded, like they're doing the man-to-man... -man, and then as soon as the 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 pit person is delivering the corner and starts his run to give the ball in, obviously all the movement happens, and there's collisions and just people are unmarked all over the place, and then the second ball is just horrific. No one knows where they're meant to be. They're like, where's my man? Fucking don't know where my man is. And they just got chances after chance for that. I mean, they, they need to seriously consider going to a partial zone or partial man marking. Um, set piece tactics on the trading ground I think otherwise I suspect Aston Villa are going to concede all sorts from set pieces throughout the throughout the season I didn't see too much from them going forward either so Aston Villa may need a bit of poli a little bit more than polish on the training ground uh, potentially someone to uh, potentially a team to sorry target Leeds vs Wolves fixture, um, I did not catch this, I've only seen the highlights, um, and the same with the Newcastle and Nottingham Forest fixtures, I have not, I've only seen the highlights from those games. Um, one thing I did see in the Leeds fixture was Aronson, who was on my watch list before the game week, looked pretty decent. Um, five, is he 5.5? 5 .5? Oh wait, where, oh, he's probably popped up my list now, he was on the last page, where's he gone? Here, Aronson. From Leeds, 5.5 million, played 84 minutes. Uh, he's wearing the number seven jersey, running around in the middle of the park, and wow, he looks awesome. He's 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 one of those players that's just he's nippy. He like nips at your heels and constantly. He's fucking rapid. He looks like he's got a bit of a um, bit of creativity in him too. Definitely someone to keep an eye on. Where's my notes for a nibbly player? Great speed. However, I do suspect he's pretty he's pretty tiny uh, playing in the centre of the park. Once he comes up against um, some pretty, you know, physical units in the centre of the park. So it's like Joel Linton from Newcastle, right? If Joel Linton was marking um, Aronson in, in a fixture, I would suspect... Aronson will get clipped. <laughs> if it was if it was me marking the Aronson lad, I'd definitely be you know hacking at his heels a bit because he's a fucking annoying player to mark. Obviously, looking like a really good player, but 
He's not quite bulky, and I suspect he's going to get pushed around a bit. But, you know, he's got the pace. Maybe he can get around those players that are trying to do the dirty on him. Uh, Newcastle Forest, I saw the highlights. I probably need to analyse that game a little bit closely. I'm not really looking at a hell of a lot of their players. Um, One thing I did see was Andreas did look pretty... um, Sorry, that was a full match. Um, Who's it? Jay Ling's. Ooh wee! Lots of football. Lot- <laughs> Lots of football. Jay Ling's um, looked uh, looked like he was on the ball a lot. So he's going to be the main create creative outlet in that team. But from what I saw in the brief highlights, I would like to sit down and watch that full match actually to um, kind of see how their new signings have come together. But we'll just skip over them for the minute. Spurs versus Southampton. Now, this is the one that I got wildly wrong in my predictions. I predicted a 1-0 Spurs victory here. I did not uh, predict exactly how um, how not on the boil Southampton, how uh, not sharp Southampton's defense were. Um specifically around shutting down second ball so I think it was the second goal where Sun uh, ball comes in I think it was from a court might have been from a corner they're working around the edge and the ball goes across to Sun far post on the left hand side and whoever is right center back in, in the mess of players did not sprint out towards Sun and he had all the time in the world to pick this ball back into the box and he knows what to do you just whip that ball in about head height, aiming at the far post with hook on it. So A, if everyone misses it, it's going to trickle in the far post past the net. Or B, all it requires is exactly what happened, which is Eric Dyer to come in, get a little flick on, and the keeper's got no chance because there's so much pace on the ball that it's just, unless it goes straight at him, he's probably not going to save it. And this is all because when the ball went out to Sun, everyone just went, Oh, look, Sun's got the ball. I I should probably go out and press him. It's not like he's a fucking half-decent player or anything. I would have suspected they would have gone, okay, Sane and Kun, shut those two down at every opportunity, and we should do quite well here. They didn't do any of that. Also, the size of the pitch comes into play. Spurs do play on a huge field. Um, And so every time Kane dropped in deep to pick up the ball, there was extra space to cover for whoever who was dropping out of defense to actually make that following run or if they had passed it on to whoever was playing in central defensive midfield to pick up Kane he was just exploiting the space and exploiting the fact that it's game week one not everyone's up to match fitness they're sprinting around in the absolute heat with all that adrenaline running through them so they they will be playing harder than any preseason game or any training session that they've done because it is in game. They are now playing proper games and there is points on the board. I think I think that A, the heat and B, the size of the pitch just did not allow Southampton. They did not have the energy to close down Spurs in the way they need to be closed down. You cannot let top world-class players have that amount of space and that, that pick of ball or delivery at multiple times throughout the match or you're going to get decimated Hassan Hood, what come on man you're man for man your your Southampton players are not going to keep up to the quality of Spurs you need to adjust your tactical awareness man for fuck anyway uh, let's move on to the Chelsea match Chelsea versus Everton this was very late in the night I, th- I stayed up and saw the first half of this and then caught the highlights uh, on the next day because um, I think the kickoff was like 4.30am and I'd been up all night um, Chilwell starts Chilwell starts did not see that coming I was kind of wondering what was going to happen with Alonso on the way out and Cucurella starting to come in I was like well if Alonso is definitely going out, you don't want to start him. Chilwell hasn't even started preseason, so maybe Cucurella does come in and start, but he hasn't had any tre- preseason training, or so it was a bit up in the air. But Chilwell does start. Chilwell did look like he was further forward than James when they're both on the pitch. It does look like it affects James's positional 
uh, how far, well, effectively, how far he gets up the pitch, just because they can't leave two, <coughs> two centre backs uh, sweeping up any counter attack by them by the lonesome. Um, and as a result, I didn't see James in too many dangerous uh, positions. So if Chilwell keeps getting starts and James is still on the pitch and still not getting forward, it, I might be looking at a sideways move here, but can't tell a hell of a lot from the very first game, especially considering it was Chilwell's first game playing, really, for the first team, and so we don't entirely know what was going, what how that is going to develop just after 90 minutes worth of football. Leicester versus Brentford, I wasn't watching this, I was actually watching the Man United game, um... So I actually haven't even seen the highlights of this, so apologies, I will not be able to comment on that at all. But the Manchester United performance was woeful. Oh, it was hard to watch. Um, all of the work that we had done pre-season and getting used to having Martial up front with Sancho and Rashford buzzing in and around him and, <coughs> excuse me, Fernandez, you know, being the mastermind in midfield and feeding balls left, right and centre, just fell to pieces by starting Ericsson. He's not, Ericsson has not played any minutes with any of these players pre-season. Then we've got a new striker up front and a new man in behind. There was no, no fluidity. No one knew what was going on. It was just... Oh. Enough said. Right, enough said. Congratulations, Brighton. Well-deserved victory. Like I said, Man United are going to concede goals this year. Lo and behold, they concede two before even scoring one. When Ronaldo came on the pitch, he didn't do much running, as I suspected. He's not doing that front press, as I suspected. Ten Hag's probably looking at that going, that is the key to how I want to play football. I want my striker running in like Martial was doing. The whole preseason, I was, you know, we're winning balls high up the pitch, counter-attacking in the final third. None of that, all because we didn't have a striker that wanted to do the work. Uh, wow! And then I did uh, manage to catch, I think it was about the first 80 minutes of the Man City versus West Ham match until De Bruyne got pulled. Um, who was my only Man City differential, uh, who did end up with the final assist for Haaland. However, De Bruyne didn't seem to have his normal game. His He was playing a lot further forward, and I think potentially he was maybe not quite used to that part of the pitch. He, he wasn't on the ball as much as he normally is. When he did drop deep to pick up the ball to start moving forward, he was the only man that was attempting any driving runs forward uh, in the centre of the park, which is good to see. But I think they're just getting used to whatever tactical changes Pep has chucked in because they they had like... It was like the two centre-backs were on halfway and then the left-back and right-back were playing as a central two in front of them with other players from forward dropping back into like a two three 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 or something it was i don't know it was quite a weird formation obviously they were adjusting to the fact that west ham did not want to come out of their own half they i mean i understand see this is what i thought hassan hoodle was going to do against spurs right moise went and did exactly that he was like all right man for man we're fucks <laughs> and said he and said he's got a abundance of talent on the pitch and so they just decided well, we'll just let them have the ball in their own half and we're not even going to go in there and try and get it and in the first 30 minutes or so i think there was like 200 oh, is it's the, the numbers were just ridiculous like i think Crystal Palace, was it, sorry, West Ham had only had like 70 passes in the whole first half of the match or something with like 20% possession. It was ridiculous. The possession was not in dangerous areas for the large parts of the match though. Most of Man City's um, position on the ball was all on halfway 
or in their own half because they wanted West Ham to come out and create space by trying to go after the defenders and they were just waiting for that happen to happen and West Ham just never did it. And so they're going to have to come up with some other ideas of exactly how to break down a team that does not want to come out and try to win the ball off you because if you're just going to sit back and hope they do, we're just going to see the same game over and over again. It was a stupidly boring game to watch from footballing sense. It was a very tactically sensible game, but the football was a little bit boring. <clears throat> um, let's obviously go to the man of the hour, Haaland. Whoa, he is rapid. <laughs> that man is fast. He's, what, six foot two? <laughs> and he sprints like a... Oh, he's like a Usain Bolt. Oh, maybe not that fast, but his his acceleration from dead start is insanely fast for someone that big, tall, and such a unit. Um, he caught Ari- I think it was Ariola off uh, in in net off guard with that penalty. Like he placed the ball down and he stepped backwards, and as soon as Ariola went to do his, hey, okay, I'm going to try and distract the, you know, what do you do? Do, do the, like the star jump thing and try to distract. Um, Harlan from taking the penalty but as soon as he started that motion with the outstep and he's in like full star mode that's when Harlan goes zips in just careers towards the ball with all of that pace and slots it in the post before Ariola seven pulled his legs back together to start the jump <laughs> it was like very smart play by Harlan he is an outstanding penalty taker we do know his record coming into this is quite it's pretty astonishing really um, but yeah, he's gonna he's gonna cause all sorts of problems. His runs are amazing too. Like he he'll peel off and he'll give just enough gap between the the defense as a striker. You typically sit between two centre backs, so you're always marked by two players, and so it's very hard to make a run away from one without running into the other centre back, right? But he he seems to be able to do it perfectly in between the spaces with enough of a passing lane for whoever's in behind him to slot him the ball through. You'll see his goal that De Bruyne fed to him. Both Haaland and Foden made the same run into the channel. Uh, Foden coming out from on the right-hand side to cut in went way more central and so split them across. But Haaland was just so fast that it was just clearly <laughs> out in front of everyone and then it didn't even take a touch. It was just a one-time finish pass past the keeper great finish as well Haaland looks devastating I think a lot of what Man City were attempting in the game was probably based on footage from the previous games they'd been watching of seeing Haaland make runs and them not feeding the ball to Haaland so they probably did their you know their uh, post-match breakdown or post-match debrief and gone all right you got the ball here Haaland's made this amazing run into space and you've gone that way why you're not looking for our new main man up front and so it almost felt like they were trying to find him too often at points De Bruyne was trying the killer pass which did not hit the mark on multiple occasions this is why he did not make it into the bonus because of his incomplete passes he didn't even make it into the top five players in Man City I think he came in with like 24 bonus points or something did he come in with yeah 24 bps uh sorry not bonus points 24 on the bonus point system which is just off this but that is simply just down to the normal kevin de bruyne a killer ball that always makes his mark but it just just was not happening for him on the day still game week one what though (sighs) so what have we learnt? Nothing much. <laughs> we kind of saw what we expected to see. Nerves are high. Game week one, there's a lot of adrenaline running around. It's actually D-Day. You know, there's it doesn't. It's not. You don't have in the back of the mind. Ah, it's just preseason anymore. You're actually in the match, and so you will see these little mistakes come in. You'll see a few nervous touches, a few more heavy touches, and so takes a good couple of game weeks before that stuff to just settle down a bit and you just get used to the fact that yes you are playing uh, for the points in the season my current plan is to do absolutely nothing for game week two I would like to roll the transfer we will see how the game week shapes out I do have a couple of talking points to go into in a little bit more detail in future videos but as a game week roundup I think that 
largely covers it. So, if you made it this far through the video, please do give it a like, and if you would like to be notified about new content coming your way soon, click on that subscribe button and hit that bell icon. And until I ca until next time, I will catch you again sometime soon. Cheers.